Okay, I will tell you this. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of details. I will just tell you, if you get close to me this morning, it looks like I got into a fight and lost. I'm scratched up. Uh, I got scratches on my face and my head. My grandson and I were hunting Thursday afternoon, and uh, we had to track a deer that he'd shot, and uh, we got lost in the swamp for five hours. Yeah. And I tied up. I tied up with all kind of brambles and bamboo and briars and limbs and the ground numerous times. But we got the deer. So, backstrap. Yes, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. But I am scratched up this morning from head to toe. And so, uh, someone already said, what happened to your face? Kim did not get a hold of me, just, just so you know. Just so you know. All right, today, um, let's just get started with the word this morning. Here's, here's the deal. Today, the topic is make room for God by knowing God. By knowing God. You know we talk a lot about this. Know God, live connected, and make a difference. And that's the center of this series uh, this year. But in John chapter 17, if you want to look there in, in your app or on the, in your Bible, however you choose to follow along this morning, Jesus is praying before his arrest. His arrest is imminent. And he's praying for his disciples. He's praying for those of us that would come later, those of us who we are here this morning. And he prays these words in John chapter 17, verse 3. Now this is eternal life. He's praying to the Lord. He said that they know you, speaking of God, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That they know you. Now what does that mean to us this morning? What does that mean to you? to know God. Um, do you know God or do you know about God? Because there's a difference, right? I mean, knowing someone and knowing about someone are two vastly different things, but yet there are people all over the world this morning that claim to know God. But probably at the, at, at the deepest part of their life, they really don't know Him, they just know about Him. People who read the Bible, People have gone to classes, people have heard people, other people talk, they've listened to preachers like myself, all of this. We know a lot about people and things. I mean, you can Google somebody, you can go on Wikipedia, at the click of a button or as fast as you can type in somebody's name or you can ask Siri or you can ask Alexa, you can have information that gives you knowledge about someone. But does that mean that you know them? Our country saddened at the passing of, of baseball great Kobe Bryant this week. And I, and I what did I say? Oh, same thing, right? <laughs> Basketball. Sorry. Sorry. Keep praying. Keep praying. I'm scratched up and beat up this morning. No. But I've just kind of watched some of the news feeds and some of the comments on some of the news feeds and people that never saw him play that never, that never met him, but they go into these things about how he impacted their life. And, and I think there's nothing wrong with that. I think that's great, but I want you to understand something. Just having a knowledge about somebody doesn't mean that you know them. And even have met someone doesn't necessarily mean that you know them. So I ask you again this morning, do you know God or do you know about God? Jesus said, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. We move over to Philippians chapter 3. Paul says something very interesting there. He says, I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ. Now, there's a word in, in John chapter 17, the word know there, and in Philippians, Philippians chapter 3, the word know there mean is gnosko. It's a Greek word, gnosko. Uh, I had to ask Pastor Tommy how to pronounce that word because I'm not a Greek scholar. I can barely speak English most of the time. So, But here's, here's, what it, here's the definition. To recognize, to understand, or understand completely. The word that they know you, Jesus is saying, I want them to recognize you, to understand, and understand you completely. Paul says, I want to know Christ. I want to understand Christ. I want to know him completely. It indicates what? A relationship. Part of what we talked about during the Freedom Series last month was simply this, that they know, that we know Christ in an intimate way, that we have a relationship with him, that it's not all about ritual, that we know Christ. 
Paul's words define for us his meaning. He's not talking about just a, just a knowledge of someone that lived in the past or a knowledge of someone that lives in another area of the world or across the street from us. The verb he uses for to know is a part of that word gnoskin, which almost always indicates a personal knowledge of an individual. It's not simply intellectual, intellectual knowledge. It's a personal experience of another person. The personal experience of another person. In the Old Testament, Jeremiah the prophet said this. He said, no longer will they teach their children to say one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I forgive their sin, I forgive their wickedness, and will remember their sins no more. That verse is repeated in Hebrews chapter 8. And the word there in, in, in Jeremiah in Hebrew, the word is yada. So we talk about gnosko and yada. They're interchangeable in the Greek and Hebrew, Hebrew uh, text. But it is the intimate personal knowledge which arises between two persons who are committed wholly to one another in a relationship that touches mind, emotions, and will. Now let me, let me take it a little deeper this morning. The word know in the Old Testament is the word that is used to describe the sexual relationship between a man and a husband and wife, a man and a woman. Adam knew Eve. And she conceived. In the New Testament, Mary said to the angel when she was approached, she said this. She said, how, when he, she said you're going to have a baby and the Holy Spirit. And she said, how can this be since I have known no man? I've not been intimate with a man. I haven't been in, Adam was intimate with Eve. But Mary said, I haven't been intimate with anybody. It wasn't Paul's aim just to have an identity with Christ. It was that his aim to know him personally. Whether it's gnosko or whether it's yada, it means the same. It is not knowledge about someone, but it is about an intimate relationship with them. How do we get to that point with God? How do we get to that point with God? You know, and I don't want anybody's mind to go perverted this morning. I'm simply saying that the verbiage that is being used in Scripture is to go beyond the intellect, to engage the mind, the will, and the emotions of a person in, in experiencing God. And God is a God who can be experienced. So how do we know God? It's not unlike how we get to know people in our day-to-day relationship, our -day -day relationships. It's not unlike how we get to know the person that we marry. I remember the first time I saw my wife. I could take you to the spot in Lakeland, Florida, the, time, the first time I saw my wife. We were, we were both at Southeastern College in the day, a long time ago now. And, and you couldn't do much down there. Because it was a Bible college, and, and Bible colleges, you know, all, all, everybody in a Bible college, they're all Christians, and they love Jesus, and they serve Jesus, and they don't do anything bad. <laughs> and so, to keep us in line, we couldn't go to movies, we couldn't do anything like that, so they had skating parties for us, roller skating parties. Now, back in those days, I was not, I was about half the man I am today, I'll just say it that way. And I never could roller skate very well. I never could skate backwards. I could barely stand up on those things. And forget ice skating. I don't, I don't even get the point you're on those blades and your, your ankles are... But anyway, we're skating and Kim and I was skating next to a friend of mine and, that I knew from, from up in the Panhandle area and, and this beautiful, brown-eyed, brown-haired, gorgeous lady skated behind, by me going backwards. Just, she was just skating backwards which I'm always in awe of that, that you can do that. And I looked at the friend, my friend, I said, Joyce, who is that? And she said, oh, that's Kimmer. And I said, well, Phil wants to meet Kimmer. Can you set that up? And so a couple of nights later, uh, we met. We met, not at a skating rink. I'd actually, some of my buddies and I, we kind of slipped out and we'd gone down the street to, the, to a pool hall and... Uh, <laughs> you know, we were doing evangelism. <laughs> and the first time that I met my wife, who is now my wife, face to face, I was leaning over a pool table with a big, big cigar in my mouth, <laughs> playing pool at the Bible college, uh, or down the street from. Me. Now, I'm not saying that you should go out and smoke cigars and drink. I'm not saying that. Or, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that's the first time we met. But something happened in that exchange. I asked her out. We went out to dinner. Uh, she went to a ball game with me that I was playing in. Then we went to dinner after the game. And, 
And something happened that night that's never happened, it's never happened in my entire dating experience. And that was, we sat and talked for hours. And I knew something had happened in my heart that night. I didn't know what. I mean, I was 19 years old, 20 years old. I didn't know what had happened, but something had happened. And I knew that something had perked my interest in this lady. And I wanted to spend as much time with her as I possibly could. So the first step, and here's what I know now, looking back at that experience and now talking about how do we get to know God, there first has to be a desire. Paul said, I want to know Christ. Notice he didn't say that I have to. He says, I want to. I want to know Christ. I have a desire to know Christ, and not just intellectually. I wanted to know Kim Hillsman, other than just in a passing sense. I wanted to know her. I wanted to get to know her. She perked my interest. I had a desire to be close to her. And, and I'll tell you what, she drug me through more junk than anybody has ever drugged me in my entire life. She did. Never had that experience either back in those days. That was weird. You know, we'd been going out for a couple of weeks and she let one night we went, I went to, she was singing somewhere with a group and I went with her because I wanted to be close to her. And after it was over, we sat down in a restaurant. She didn't sit next to me. And I'm going, what's up with that? I mean, we've been out for like two weeks. I'm thinking things are moving the way I'm, I'm thinking things are moving. And she, so we get back to the dorm room. I said, is there a problem? She said, I just think we ought to be friends. <laughs> she may be watching this morning, so I'm going to make sure I'm accurate in my, <laughs> she's homesick. So y'all pray for her, but. But here's the deal. And it was up and down for like months. Some days she thought she might love me. The other day she just wanted to be my friend. You know? I didn't want no friend. Got plenty of friends. Didn't want no friend. I wanted to know this girl. Every day, every day I went to the store and I bought her a a red rose and I bought her a little card and just said, I love you. Oh, yes. And I left, it, I left it either on her car or I left it in her mailbox or by, by the window at her door. Every day, every day, every day, every day. Most of the time I'm just getting, I just want to be your friend. <laughs> but still I pursued because I had a desire to know her. A few months ago, Pastor Tommy did a teaching and he, and he said this in the teaching. He said, desire is the thing the spirit can work with. If you and I want to know Christ, we have to begin with a desire to know him. It's not something that we can go into flippantly. It's something that we have to pursue with all of our heart. We have that desire to know God. The second thing we do is we respond to his love. We have to know what he's done for us. We talked about this during freedom, but it bears repeating again. We have to know what he's done. While we were sinners... While we were unworthy, when we were still doing the things that did not bring him joy and pleasure, that was violating his holiness, while we were doing those things, he still died for you and I. And because he did that, we can respond because he made the first move. But it's more than that. Why did he do that? Because he first loved us. Know who he is. Your creator, your savior, your redeemer, your healer. All of those things. But he also made the first move towards you. So we have to respond. We have the desire to know him, and then we respond to his love. The third thing we do is practice the disciplines. Richard Foster wrote a book years ago, uh, Celebration of Discipline. If you get a chance, you want to pick up that book. It's a great book. But it goes into a a ton of the spiritual disciplines that are out there. I'm just going to hit a few of them this morning. The first thing we got to do, we got to study the word. I mean, we're making room for God. We're reading the Bible through this year as a community of faith. And I hope that you're involved in that. If you can't get on version, go pick up a a guide at the the hub out in the foyer there. But let's read the Bible through together. Let's study the Word of God. Let's get to know God. Get involved in a a group that's teaching the Word of God, that's that's unfolding the Word of God for you. Read it. Study it. Because that's one of the most important disciplines of our life. If we want to know God, we need to read His book. Amen? We want to read His book. I mean, he like wrote it through other people, but it's his his words. So we read the word of God. The next thing we do is what? We pray. 
And not just here on Sunday mornings. I get my prayer in on Sunday mornings. If, you get, if, if all you get is Sunday morning, it, it takes like 30 seconds. No. You say, well, I, I don't, I'm not one of these kind of guys that can get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and read my Bible and pray. Look, your pastor is not one of those kind of guys either. And I don't know many people that can. So let that, let, let that be left for alone in this morning. And here, here's what I'm saying. Take some time throughout your day to have a conversation with God. If I never told Kim that I loved her, if we never had a conversation, we would have never moved beyond the night that she skated past me in that skating ring. You want to get to know someone, you have to have a conversation with them, right? Well, I have to know my spouse online. I get it. But was there not emails and stuff exchanged over a period of time as you began to share things with one another? What is that called? Even if it's on, on the email and text, it's still a conversation. you got to talk to them. From desire, we respond to their love. And then we, we, we study the Word of God and we pray. We simply talk to God. Well, I don't know how to pray. How about this? Here's a guy. Hey, God. It's me. I got some stuff on my mind. There's this, and there's this, and there's this. And I'm really not going to know what you think about it. And then he's going to do this. Okay. I put my book there. It's like got all the answers in it. Read it. But then listen. Because I'll talk back to you. I'll talk back to you. Now, talking back to God, God talking back to us is probably not going to be this James Earl Jones voice or Val Kilmer, whichever one you prefer. But here's the deal. Here's the deal. Praying is talking to God and listening to God. Impressions. As you read the word, certain things will jump off. You'll have these thoughts. God will give you God thoughts. Which leads me to the next, next one. That is a time of fasting. Setting aside a time throughout your day. Something in your life, whether it's sometimes people fast caffeine. Uh, sometimes they fast food. Sometimes they fast television. Sometimes they fast certain types of music or all music. Sometimes they just, whatever, whatever God lays on your heart, that's what you fast. But you set aside that time to spend it in, in communication with God. You're consecrating that time. You're setting it aside. Now, look. Don't go into this thing and go, I'm going to fast all for 21 days. I'm just going to drink water and juice. And that's, look, I'm telling you, before you do something that heavy, go see your doctor. Be careful when you start fasting foods. If you've got medical conditions, all of those things play into it. Be smart about it. Okay? But we need to be people of fasting. And then we need to be people of meditation. Society has destroyed in us a lot of the things that God wants us to do because we, we, we equate meditation with some new age thing. And long before there was new age, the psalmist said, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. What are we meditating on? Maybe it's just one verse of scripture. Maybe it's on, we sang the song, Your Goodness of God. This, well, that last song just tore me up inside because it's, a, it's about the faithfulness and the goodness of God. Meditate on that. Just think about that. And meditation, a part of meditation is also just listening, being quiet, being still. For a lot of us that were raised in Pentecost and charismatic uh, and charismatic, sometimes it's hard to just be quiet before the Lord. Sometimes, you know, I mean, I can remember days when we'd have those moments in church where it would kind of get quiet and, and you could feel the presence of the Lord very heavy. And in the middle of all that, somebody's got to do something. They got to jump up and speak in tongues or give a word of prophecy or something like that. And all God's saying is, that ain't me. I just want you to be quiet for a little bit so I can talk to you. I'm not dissing the gifts of the Spirit. I'm saying we need to learn the art of silence and quiet submission in meditation before the Lord sometimes. Because most of the time when we're praying, it's yeah, 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 yeah. We're just talking, 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 talking. Okay, God, amen. And we go back to what we're doing. And he's up there going, I got something to say. You just need to be quiet and listen for a minute. You ever have to do that with your kid or your grandkids? We were in that swamp Thursday night with Braden. He's 10 years, 11 years old, and we're, we're lost as a ball in high weeds. 
and I'm trying to get us out of there. And I, there's no landmarks, it's dark, the canopy's heavy, and I got a flashlight and everything looks the same. And he's just jabber, jabber, pop, 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 pop. Finally, I said, Braden, I need you to be quiet, son. And just listen to me. I know what was going on. He was scared. He's scared. I said, look. And then he said, Papa, we're going to spend a night in this swamp. <laughs> and I said, I don't know yet, buddy. But in seven hours, it's going to be daylight. And if it's daylight, we'll get out of here. <laughs> I said, if we have to spend the night, you're going to sit right down next to this pine tree. We're going to sit right here by this pine tree. And we'll stay right here with your deer until it's all over with. And then we'll get out. But I know he was scared. And I finally just like, said, please, just be quiet, buddy. Sometimes God wants to say that to us. But he's not like a pawpaw. He's, not, he's more of a gentleman. Now. He's not going to tell you to be quiet. He's just going to back away himself. Meditation is being quiet and listening. Meditating on something, whether it's a passage, whether it's the goodness of God, whatever it is, and then focusing your mind on God. Then the discipline of worship and celebration. Worship is, more, is personal. It's also corporate. It's not something that's separated out here. But here's the question. I ask you this as we started service this morning. What are you putting into your personal and corporate worship? If you come in here on Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock and you expect Pastor Charlie and the worship team to drag you into the presence of God, guess what? You're never going to get there. You have to come into this house in corporate worship with this attitude. I have had a hell-ish week. But today, I am going to worship my God. And I'm going to push through the pain and the agony and all the stress of this week. I'm going to set that aside for a moment. And I'm going to offer up, even though I don't feel like it, I'm going to offer up the sacrifice of praise. And we determine to put into it. And because we determine to put into it, what happens? If we draw near to God, what does God say? I will draw near to you. But it doesn't stop with Sunday morning, 9 a.m., what about Sunday evening? What about Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday? How much worship are you putting in? And I'm not just talking about singing worship songs. I'm talking about how much time are you engaging in the pursuit of God? I mean, do you really want to know Him? How much time are you putting into that pursuit? That's worship. That's worship. The next discipline is service. Jesus served. He gave us the example. We experience Jesus. We experience God when we serve others, when we give of our time, when we give of our talents, when we give of our treasure. We're experiencing God because God did all of those things for us. Jesus gave us these examples. He's the model. And when all of those things are taking place, when we're doing those disciplines, God is close to us. And we can experience him in those ways. Which is the next, the next step, and that is to experience God. You see, it's really hard. It's really hard sometimes for us, especially as intellectuals, it's really hard to disengage the brain and just engage the emotions. I mean, I've actually had people say, well, why do y'all sing songs three and four and five times you know, around and around and around? That just, that's for, look, whatever it takes. Sometimes because of our intellect, we have difficulty disengaging our brain and just letting God come in and saturate us. But you see, when he says you'll love me with your heart, mind, soul, and strength, he's talking about total possession. That's your mind, that's your body, that's your will, and that's your emotions. You make the decision to let God have all of you. Well, I haven't cried in 40 years. Well, maybe it's time you let God bust down the rough exterior and let tears flow. I've been a Christian for 987 years, but I've never cracked a smile, bless God. <laughs> Maybe it's time to smile. Maybe it's time to smile. Experiencing God. Often I think that we would have, if, if we really had an, a true experience with God, we might be like the Israelites when God wanted to talk to them personally. It scared them. They said, don't do that. Sometimes you've seen stuff. If you've been around Pentecost and Charismata, you've seen things, and sometimes, it, it's, sometimes it's God, sometimes it's not God. I'm just going to be honest with you. But you can't, you can't throw it all out in experience and go, I just, that's just weird. I don't, no, just, just say, God, have all of me, and let me experience you in your fullness in my life, whatever that looks like in you. 
Whatever it happens, and however it happens, you've got to be willing. And this, I had to pray this prayer years ago. I had an experience with God one time. I've had, I've had numerous experiences with God, but I had one that was very significant in my life. And I had, before, before it ever happened, I remember praying about two weeks prior. I just remember saying, Lord, I don't care what you do to me as long as I know that it's you moving in me. You know, and for me, for me, when God moves in my heart and moves, moves in my spirit, most of the time, most of the time I have tears. That's just, that's just the way the Holy Spirit moves in my life. You know, and I, I, I know sometimes I'm rough and I'm gruff and all, but I'm telling you, there's nothing like just letting, when, when God just turns the waterworks on and just cry before the Lord. Amen. It's a beautiful thing. I'm not saying that's the way God's going to use you, going to do with you, but he might. The key is not saying, God, I, you can only do this to me. I can only experience you this way. Don't just experience God in your mind. Let it be a part of your will and your emotions and let your body engage in that because that's what he said. I will offer my body as a living sacrifice to God. A living sacrifice. We sang a song a while ago that says, uh, we're going to dance like we're dancing right now. And I looked around and guess what? I wasn't nobody dancing. Now, some of you may go, well, Phil, you lead leading. I'm going to tell you right now, you don't want that to happen. That's an ugly thing. I'm going to tell you straight up. You don't want me doing no dancing. What I'm saying is this. If you love God and you're pursuing God, and you desire to know him and you're responding to his love and you're practicing the disciplines, then there comes a time when we just open our heart and our mind and our, heart and our soul and we experience him in the fullness. Embracing every opportunity to know him intimately through each and every turn in life. You and I will only know God. We will only really know him if we engage in actively seeking him. It's not something that's going to happen by osmosis. It's not going to happen because your mom and dad had a relationship with him or your grandparents or your great-grandparents or your friends across the street, or even your children, or your, or your mom and dad. It's not going to happen that way. It's going to happen when you actively seek him. What you and I seek first is what organizes our life. If we really want to know God, then it's going to show in our time. It's going to show in how we approach God. God's not going to be secondary to the rest of the things in our life. We will make the time to spend with him. I made time to spend with Kim. My grades suffered greatly. <laughs> but I knew I wanted to know her. I, wanted to, I, wanted, I knew I'd fallen in love with her within the first month. Took her a few months to realize it. But, but the truth of the matter is, I did everything I could to get to know her. Everything I could. In a couple months, we celebrate 37 years together. Here's the thing. Thank you. Here's the thing, guys. If you want to be able to sing of the faithfulness of God, then you've got to allow him to show himself faithful. If you want to experience the goodness of God, then you've got to allow him and receive his goodness into your life. And we do that by actively seeking. We make room for God in our life by getting to know him. Romans 8, Paul said this, he said, I am convinced that neither death nor life, angels nor demons, the present, the future, any powers, any height nor depth or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of our God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I am convinced. How did Paul get from I want to know to I am convinced? He had a desire. He responded to God. He practiced the disciplines, he experienced God, and he was convinced. I can only be convinced if I know, and I will only know if I want to. So what do I tell you this morning? Let's make room for God, amen? Let's stand all over the room.